As most of you watching know, time and time again, um, we've held these press conferences in the Capitals Rotunda, but obviously this year is a little bit different. Um, it's been a tough year for our program, but without a doubt, I'm really proud of the work that Sam has been doing to keep us in shape. With that said, I've been really fortunate to work alongside him for the past year, and though we have not gotten our model convention this year, we got to see a lot of delegates step up from across the street, state, leading as leaders in this program and innovating new ways to keep us going. Virtually, we saw a lively debate that showed us just how dedicated these people who represent the program are. COVID-19 may have had a hard hit, but Sam made sure we came back even stronger. Today, we wanted to give you the press conference that we would have otherwise missed out on and get an insider look into what being a youth governor during this time is like. With that said, I'd like to pass it over to Shannon Ludwig, this year's press secretary, to start us off. Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Ludwig. I'm a senior from the Boyertown YMCA delegation, and I'm grateful to serve to have served as your 2019-2020 press secretary. We have celebrated the turn of the decade back in January. We were all looking forward to something. Whether it was model, graduation, or a trip, the excitement built up all year and it was so close to reality. But an event so impressive changed the world. About seven weeks ago, the first case of COVID-19 emerged in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Schools began to close and the somethings came to an untimely end. We were placed under a stay-at-home order and adopted social distancing measures. Each of our lives has changed drastically in some way due to the virus, but that's not the end. Even in this time, we're capable of greatness. Instead of focusing on what was canceled, we should treat, treat the situation as an opportunity. This past weekend, the first ever Youth and Government Virtual Model was held where delegates were able to make the best out of the situation we found ourselves in with modified activities. Additionally, the Youth Governor and his administration came up with six executive orders regarding social and financial issues in the Commonwealth, which will be addressed in his speech along with his policies. Now I'd like to introduce you to your 74th Youth Governor, Sam Bisno. Thank you so much, Shannon, and hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the 2020 PA AG press conference. Um, like Emma said, typically the speech is used to outline the policy priorities of the governor and his or her administration, you know, the bills they're looking to sign at model. And I will do a little bit of that, but I'd kind of be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the elephant in the room, the reason that the press conference is being done over Zoom and not at the feet of the steps in the rotunda at the Capitol. There's no doubt that COVID-19 has forced society to restructure itself across the Commonwealth and the country and has drastically changed the near future for everyone. There is little that is the same now as it was only two or three months ago. For us high schoolers and middle schoolers, we've lost our trips, our proms, our athletic seasons, our graduation ceremonies, and not to mention the rest of the 2019-2020 school year. But we had a choice of what could be achieved during this unprecedented time. Despite not being able to participate in the typical model convention held at the Capitol, we've really done our best to overcome the obstacles in our path and accomplished, I think, pretty cool things. The presiding officers, along with our YAG advisors, who are amazing, have worked really hard to create a virtual model for all delegates in all branches uh, to participate in. And at this year's first virtual model, over 100 legislative delegates debated a total of 20 bills and successfully passed 15 of them. Judicial delegates argued their case in a fun online environment, and press delegates worked on various articles as well as projects for social media accounts. So pat yourselves on the back for that. That was really amazing. If nothing else, this pandemic has revealed or at least magnified some of the underlying inequities in our society. Schools are being forced to stay open because millions of children across America have no other place to get breakfast or lunch. Essential workers and frontline caregivers are being given what's called hazard pay, which is great. But now that we see just how essential they are, you have to wonder why that hazard pay isn't standard pay. It still might seem far away, but eventually COVID-19 will pass. And when that happens, we'll need to think critically about whether to return to the status quo or whether we can take the lessons we've learned and build a more just society than we lived in prior to the virus. So with that in mind, although we're not passing any bills officially this year, I wanted to take a few minutes to tell you about just some of my administration's policy goals. These are goals that we've began developing back in December when the administration was selected, and they're goals we use to evaluate bills as recently as pre -lenage. And generally, all of these policy aims are rooted in one guiding principle that I think we can all agree on, increasing the standard of living for Pennsylvanians. In health and welfare, to me and to my administration, that means addressing two major problems in the Commonwealth, the opioid epidemic and the availability of affordable health care and health insurance for working Pennsylvanians. With the former, we want to require that all police carry Narcan, create needle exchange programs, and provide funding for rehab and treatment. 
For the latter, we'd like to build something of a public option within the state and dramatically lower the cost of pharmaceuticals. Spending money on education shouldn't be as much of a burden as it currently is. Everyone is entitled to a level of education suitable to them, and who are we to stop them from reaching their full potential? We want to ensure that the state is spending its resources in a way that benefits as many Pennsylvanian students as possible, which means holding charter schools to the same standards as traditional public schools. And once those students graduate, we want to provide subsidies for those attending colleges or universities who need them. Even out of college, though, it's difficult for many to find stable jobs. And for those who are struggling, it's important that there's a decent income that they can rely on until they find you know, a long-term career. We want to raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour and ensure that everyone has access to a union. Because we know that even though those jobs are considered by some to be entry level, for a lot they are careers and it's important that people are paid what they deserve. To help this effort, the state can give preference to union workforce when contracting for agencies such as PennDOT. Which brings us to transportation. We think transportation needs to be clean and efficient. We know that we're facing a real challenge in global warming and though it might have taken sort of a rear view mirror position due to coronavirus, it will come back and it will come back strong. And we believe that transportation needs to be aimed towards decreasing negative impacts on the environment. This means tougher regulations on emissions and cleaner burning fuels for public transportation. In that vein, we hope to implement a statewide moratorium on fracking and adopt California's tailpipe emission standards. Big business needs to be monitored more closely to ensure a fair system for consumers. As a state, we need to update our tax codes as, pro as we progress further into the 21st century, and we need to ensure that businesses are serving their cons consumers, not the other way around. We want to tax online transactions between consumers and vendors on online services like Amazon, but for people to even use Amazon, there's a requirement for internet access, and that's something that a lot of Pennsylvanians, especially in rural areas, don't have access to. Pennsylvanian homes and businesses suffering from slow or no internet access could be assisted by a subsidy. Subs such a subsidy would be welcome when it comes to rural community hospitals as well. There's a lack of steady patients in rural hospitals due to the much sparse sparser population, so hospitals often struggle to keep the lights on. In desperate times like these, the danger of losing more hospitals and putting more doctors out of work puts entire, entire communities at risk for the spread of COVID-19. Modernization won't just come through faster internet speeds and greater access to hospitals, but also through greater access to voting ballots. Automatic voter registration alongside same-day voting and registration would remove many of the barriers to voting. Additionally, recognizing election day as a state holiday would only further help increase voter turnout, especially concerning the 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. time slot allowed for voting interferes with many people's working hours. It's not just through voting that we can ensure representation for all residents of the Commonwealth, though. People of color and members of the LGBT plus community are sorely lacking the protections granted to most others in the state. Though Pennsylvania provides discrimination protection for LGBT plus community members in state employment, there is still a lack of protection for those people uh, when they're tenants or would-be tenants. Landlords actually in Pennsylvania reserve the right to deny property to members of the LGBT plus community based on their sexual orientation or identity, and they're only legally forbidden from discriminating based on race, sex, or religion. To further protect our minorities and their votes, we're in favor of an anti-gerrymandering legislation and we'd also like to mandate that all police officers wear body cams, as police brutality disproportionately affects African Americans and other people of color. Finally, we hope to implement a, uh, a ban on cash bail, enforce much stricter common sense gun legislation, and cease all cooperation with ICE within the state. Wow, that's a long list. But I feel like, and I think the other members of my administration feel like each item is vitally important to moving forward as a commonwealth. It does beg the question, though, of how we're going to pay for it all. Pennsylvania currently allows corporations to utilize the Delaware loophole, which reduces their taxes by allowing them to base themselves out of De Delaware. By banning corporations that do a majority of their business in Pennsylvania from being based out of Delaware, Pennsylvania would receive that money back in tax revenue, and that would go a long way towards effectively implementing the measures I just talked about. To collect more funds Pennsylvania needs to help its residents, we must hold the wealthy accountable for contributing their fair share. And it turns out that we can raise revenue at the same time we're accomplishing a lot of those goals I just outlined. We can reintroduce the graduated income tax, introduce higher education and or sorry, higher extraction taxes on fracking and tax landlords on their end of the rent. Additionally, while we have taxes on sugary drinks and other such things, our luxury tax isn't really what it could be. And a higher tax on luxuries, luxuries such as jets and yachts will bring in more revenue that the state needs. 
especially without model as a background, it might seem like that was a lot. And that's because it is. I and the rest of my administration are as disappointed as everyone else that we weren't able to pass any of that legislation. But it doesn't mean that those ideas should fall by the wayside. Adopting even just a few of the dozen or so measures that I just laid out would dramatically increase the standard of living for the vast majority of Pennsylvanians. And I hope that we're aware of those things as we look at how to rebuild the Commonwealth after COVID-19 subsides. Recently, I should mention my administration authored a series of executive orders to offer working people protections in response to COVID-19 in the hopes that that will lay the foundation for what we're to do afterwards and help in the immediate sense. And if you haven't given those a read, I would suggest that you do. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. And I think you're muted. Thanks, Sam. Um, so yeah, we'll just move into questions. So our first one actually comes from Instagram and it is, how do you think COVID-19 will affect more conservative politicians in the long term? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, this is an unprecedented time for all politicians and nobody really knows what they're doing. There's no blueprint for this. But I do think that on balance, conservative politicians have been the ones pushing to reopen the economy more than others. And I recently saw a poll that only 14% of Americans support reopening the economy at this point. So I think conservative politicians who are pushing for those things should, should consider what their constituents actually want. Um, and I think when we look back on COVID-19, we're either going to tell a story of something that could have been prevented, but that we you know, at least somewhat managed to keep under control, or we're going to tell a story of something that we were about to control, and then we reopened everything and it spiraled out of control again. So I think conservative politicians who are pushing to reopen the economy should rethink that. Great. Um, so at this time, we're waiting for election results to come back. And with that said, what advice could you give to the next governor? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I ran for governor, I had a lot of things I wanted to accomplish. I didn't think that this would be where we're at right now, but neither did anybody. Um, and so I think the lesson that I've sort of taken away and that I think could be applied to all governors is, you should identify a few things you really want to get done um, and you should stay flexible. And what's most important is that people voted for you because they believe in your leadership capabilities and what you ran on in your platform is important, but there may come a time where you have to sort of sacrifice some of those things and make a decision that's best for the whole state. Um, and that's what you're in your office to do. So, um, you know, have your priorities, but stay flexible. Our next question is also from Instagram. How can delegations recover and move forward from this year? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's going to be tough. Uh, I'm not going to be around here, but uh, I know at least people in my delegation, that's something they're already thinking of. Um, and I know in my delegation, like I think in many delegations, a lot of our leaders are seniors. So I would say it's important to be thinking about future leadership right now, because if you're coming back in the fall, hopefully, um, and you don't have any sort of leadership in place, it's going to be really hard to restart. Um, staying in communication with all of your current delegates and, you know, just assuring them that we're going to get through this and when we come out on the other end, we're still going to have a YAG program. Um, and of course, there is always the chance that in the fall, we're not back to normal, that this, you know, either resurges or we just haven't decided it's safe to go back. And so, you know, exploring options like Zoom and how you can start, start thinking about how, if need be, fingers crossed that it won't happen, but if need be, you can run a delegation virtually. This question is sort of more personal to you, but what were some highlights for you from this year of YAG? Yeah, I mean, I gotta say that, of course, nobody wanted the coronavirus to happen, but I've been so blown away by how all of my other POs, um, the advisors, everyone else in the state has rallied around this moment and built something out of it. So virtual model was a huge source of pride for me. In terms of like specific things that I hope to accomplish or did accomplish, um, you know, meeting with elected officials, which we did in, in early May, almost a year ago now, that was something that was really cool. Um, we met with the, the governor and other top elected officials and sort of talked to them about policy. And then also, um, you know, this didn't end up happening, but we were going to have a college fair at, at, um, at Model. And that's also something that I was really passionate about, and it was coming together. So, um, you know, I was proud to see it start to, to solidify, even if it didn't end up happening. Speaking of that college fair, moves nicely into our next question. That's a part of your platform that a lot of people were interested in when you were running. Can you describe what that would have looked like um, if model had actually occurred? Yeah, so we had to cancel model a little bit over a month before it was set to take place. But even at that point, we had reached out to 
um, I think about 20 colleges, we were about to send out a second round of emails and we had heard back from I think four had confirmed already. Um, so what would have happened is uh, Saturday night during a, a mandatory fun as it's called, um, there would have been a college fair, delegates would have been encouraged to go um, talk to college representatives and the college representatives would have a chance to stay during Saturday, observe what's going on, talk to you guys, um, and really become familiar with the program because it is an amazing program and colleges should know about it. Um, so it was coming together. I'm upset that it didn't happen, of course, but I hope it's something that future leadership considers doing. So you've mentioned you're kind of blown away by the way that staff and advisors and the other POs have kind of pulled together during this time. How, for you specifically, has working with staff and advisors in YAG affected you? Yeah, you know, um, when you're when you're elected governor, I don't know if this will happen this year, but at least in theory, you go to the governor's conference in Washington D.C. Um, and actually, Greg Rutter, who's the head of our program, is one of the advisors there at that conference. And I remember him saying something when we were sort of talking about how all of our, all of our different programs, you know, operated. One of the things he said was that, and that I noticed in talking to other governors, was that a lot of times advisors play a much more active role in deciding policy for the program. And that's just not the case in Pennsylvania. They really are there to serve us and to help make what we want to happen, happen. Um, but we're really the, the leaders of the program and they honor that and they're there to support us. And that's been so amazing, especially in a time like this where we've had a lot of decision making to do and they've really sort of deferred to us. They've, they've helped us when we need help. They've given us their support and advice, um, but they don't control it. And I really, really appreciate that. And I'm fortunate that we're in a program that sees the value of student leadership like that. So you mentioned a whole long list of policy. Out of that one, which one was your favorite and why do you think it was the most important? So I think my favorite um, is probably the executive orders that we wrote in response to the coronavirus, just because that's not something that I've seen done by governors before. And I was proud that we could sort of use our platform as student leaders to respond directly to the coronavirus. Um, in terms of policy that I had hoped to implement at model, I would say the environmental policy that the taxes on on fracking and the tailpipe emissions, things like that, um, are probably my favorite just because environment is one of the issues I'm most passionate about and one of the most pressing issues, um, so. Great, um, so we sort of just talked about how working with staff has affected you quite differently this year. How would you say working with your other POs has looked like during this pandemic? Because it's definitely been very interesting. It has been very interesting, and Emma, I mean, I'm sure you could answer this question too, but, um, yeah, we've been on calls, um, if not more than once a week, at least once a week, constantly texting, trying to plan out virtual model, how to run elections. I mean, you don't really realize how many of your practices are like you take for granted until you can't do any of them. So doing elections, like we just had to completely rethink how we do that or having a model on Zoom. I mean, that seems like unfathomable maybe three months ago, but we had to make it happen. So um, it's been just constant communication and everyone has been so, so amazing. Emma especially has been like on top of all of the outreach and everything that goes on, um, sort of just informing, you know, the 700 plus delegates of what us seven POs are talking about all the time. Um, and I really don't, I couldn't have asked for a better team and I don't think we could have had a better result um, if we wanted to. So I'm really proud of, of the work we did and of everyone, every PO. So out of those seven POs, five of us are seniors this year, and you know we're heading off to college, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the fall. Um, so since this is your last year in the program, what has been your favorite memory um, from YAG as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I got to say that I think when I look back on YAG, it will be just working with the other POs and, and virtual model and things like that, because that's been, you know, the most sort of active role I've played in YAG throughout my four years. But if I'm not allowed to pick a memory from this year, uh, I, I always go back to this memory from freshman year when I was, I really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, truthfully, I was elected a committee chair. I didn't really even know what a committee chair was, um, nor did I know anything about the legislative process. And I proposed an amendment on the gold house floor in front of like 150 people. Uh, and it was like the last few hours of, of debate for the entire weekend. And I didn't realize that if the amendment passed, the bill, which had already passed through the Senate, would have to go back to the Senate. Um, and it would just run out of time. It would never get passed by the governor. So once I realized that, uh, I ended up speaking con on my own amendment um, in front of everyone and voting against my own amendment and encouraging everyone else to vote against my own amendment. I think the amendment was like reforming like a funding section or something like that. 
and it ended up failing literally unanimously. Not a single person voted for the uh, amendment, including myself. So, um, you know, <laughs> that really stuck out to me and a bit of a humbling moment. You know, I come in there as a freshman thinking like, oh, this YAG thing isn't too hard. And then you get shot down by 150 people. But, you know, we rebound. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, so being a youth governor is a unique, unique position that not a lot of people get to experience, especially in such a short time as four or five or six years in YAG. So with that perspective, how would you describe YAG in one word and why? One word, yeah. Um, I think I might cheat. I might use a word like amalgamation, which means, you know, many different things coming together because it is many different things coming together. I don't think you can really sum up YAG in one word, but that's kind of the beauty of it. Like, I can say, at least from my experience, and I, I think a lot of people might share this experience, I kind of grew up in an echo chamber, a bit of a bubble. Um, most of the people that I associate with on a daily basis uh, share my opinions, share my perspectives of the world. And so joining YAG has really been eye-opening and hearing uh, what the experiences and backgrounds and opinions of countless other people throughout the state is, uh, really sort of changes your perspective and makes you realize that you're just one very small piece of a very large world. Um, and I think that's really what's amazing about YAG is that we all come together and we all share very, very different ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, we all respect each other. We're all friends. And, um, you know, if YAG was purely about debate, it wouldn't be half the program it is. So it's that sense of camaraderie that you build along with the debate that I think makes it amazing. So just to kind of end us off here, we're definitely in a unique situation this year. So we'll take it back to memories from last year when you were running. Um, definitely one of the things that made you stand out was your catchphrase that you ran on. So with that said, what does getting biz nasty actually entail? Because I think all of us are still wondering. You know what? I'm kind of wondering that myself too. Um, I, th I feel like biz nasty is one of those things when like you can't really describe it, but when you have gotten biz nasty, you'll know. Um, you know, <laughs> Biz Nasty was like a nickname that I got on like my t-ball team or something. And for whatever reason, multiple different people that don't know each other have nicknamed me Biz Nasty throughout the course of my life. And um, so my advisor, when I was like telling him I was going to run for governor, said like, oh, your slogan should be let's get Biz Nasty somewhat jokingly. And I was like, okay, sure. And I just kind of ran with it. And it became something of a meme. And at that point, I couldn't really abandon it. Like once everyone was hashtagging, let's get Biz Nasty, I was like, I guess I have to own this now. But if I ever do find out what getting biz nasty means, I will get back to you. Just to kind of close us out here, I'd like to thank Shannon and Sam both for their time. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's definitely been an interesting year in YAG, but to have things like this where we can still do these things online kind of shows just how much this program is adapting to the situation we're in. Um, hopefully next year will be normal and the next governor can have a normal conference. But um, other than that, we appreciate you guys watching and listening in and you know, keep tuning into YAG, our Instagram, our YouTube, et cetera, to kind of follow where the rest of this year is going. So thank you guys for watching. Yeah, yeah just real quick. Uh, I just want to say thank you to, to Emma and Shannon for organizing this. I mean, it, you, they could be totally excused for just saying like, we don't want to do this and everyone would understand. Emma has been amazing as, as I already said, Shannon, I mean, I should give her credit. She wrote that entire speech, um, you know, just like because, because she cares about it. And um, so I've just really, Loved working with you guys, and this has been fun. So thank you guys.